Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Marcia Eli, Director of Programs at the Brooklyn Public Library's Center for Brooklyn History, and I'm a member of the Library's Arts and Culture team, BPL Presents. As we commemorate Hispanic Heritage Month, tonight's program takes a deep look at what a more inclusive and just future for the 60 million plus Latinx people in America would look like. It's inspired by the new book, If We Want to Win. If We Want to Win includes 20 essays by Latinx leaders from all sectors of society. And I'm excited that some of them are here tonight from across the country to share their experiences and perspectives. You'll hear about each of them in a moment. I just wanna say that I am honored to welcome them to our virtual stage. So I have a few quick notes as always. First, I encourage all to explore If We Want to Win. It is a rich and thought-provoking book. And to help with that, we will put a link in the chat to the website of a local Brooklyn bookstore, the community bookstore in Park Slope. So you can, with a click, learn more, and if so inspired, purchase from an independent bookstore. Second, you have the option for closed captioning tonight. That function is activated by clicking the icon at the bottom of your screen. And finally, please join in tonight. Share your questions for our guests. Simply type them into the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your screen. Now it's my honor to introduce our moderator, Marcos Molitas whose many accomplishments I will winnow down in the interest of getting to the meat of the conversation. It's always a little painful for me to do that. But um, so Marcos Belitsas is a political act activist, writer, and businessman who founded Daily Coast, the nation's largest progressive online community and co-founded SB Nation, which became Vox Media. In 2018, he launched Civics, a polling and data operation that tracks opinions on candidates issues and elected officials. In addition to countless articles and blog posts, Marcos is the author of three nonfiction books. Marcos, thank you so much for guiding this conversation. It's really a pleasure to have you. Um, and I will hand the virtual podium over to you. Thank you so very much. Thanks for hosting us and this conversation and thank you for keeping that intro short. It's painful to me. Uh, <laughs> when people uh, introduce me. This is gonna be a fantastic conversation. I just had a chance to, to meet the panelists uh, before the programming and we already started having some good conversations. So I'm excited to introduce them and get the conversation started. Nelly Garbea is Rhode Island Secretary of State since 2015. She became the first uh, Hispanic Latin A candidate to be elected to a statewide office in all of New England. Laura Gomez is a professor of law, sociology, and Chicana, Chicano studies at UCLA. She is the author of Inventing Latinos, a new story of American racism, as well as Manifest Destinies, Mapping Race, and Misconceiving Mothers. And we have Anjanette Delgado. Anja is a Puerto Rican writer and journalist. Her book, The Heartbreak Pill, won a 2009 Latino International Book Award. She is also the author of The Clairvoyant of Calle Ocho. So welcome everybody. I'm glad we all were brought together to have this conversation. And it, it before we even, you know, the, the, the name of the book is If We Want to Win. And we is such an in incredibly difficult concept for our community to properly define. Just in the last uh, three minutes, how long have we been going? Four minutes, we heard Hispanic, Latinx, Latin A, Chicana, Chicano, and I may have missed something else. It is absolutely uh, incredible how we haven't been able to truly, truly define what that is. I mean, we can define who we are as a nationality, right? We have Guanacos from, um, from El Salvador, which is what I am. We have Boricua from Puerto Rico. We have Chicanos from Mexico and Chicanas. We have uh, Chapinas from Guatemala. We all have a national identity that we wear so proudly, but ask us to define who we are collectively and everybody has a different opinion. And, and Latinx is one of the ones that just got used. Latinx, a Pew study, Pew looked into this last year, 3% 
of this community uses Latinx. And 65% of Latinos, Latinas, that they don't even want to see Latinx, right? So we are at a, at, there's, there's generational differences. Younger people like Latinx. There are regional differences. You see Hispanic in the Northeast. You see uh, Latino in the West and so on. So there is a, a big sort of, it's not even a debate. It's a cacophony of noises trying to define us. And so I'm actually going to start with Anja because I was actually Googling all of you. So I knew uh, what you guys were about to get an idea. And I found an interview in a Latin post where you had a very, um, you had a very unique distinction between Hispanic and Latino. And I'm hoping you can share that with us because it's a great starting point in this conversation. Well, thank you so much. Um, I wanna preface what I'll say saying that it's my own definition. Uh, I'm not a scholar. Um, and that I think it comes from being a writer. You know how we read certain literatures. We read French literature versus Russian literature. And the reason we do that is because we, we think that Russian writers will have a similar ex experience. Right, and we and we and we want to study what made that literature be that way or treat those themes. So when I think about Latinx, Latine, Latinos, Hispanics, I think experientially. And so I'm Puerto Rican everywhere else except in the United States. I am only Latina here. When I'm anywhere else, where are you? From? I'm Puerto Rican. Where do you live? I live in the United States, right? Um, so for me, Latino is the one that I use because Hispanic means it, it speaks to, to tongue, to your language. And we know now that a lot of Latinos do not speak Spanish, but culturally they are Latinos. So for me, Latino means, Marcos, people from Latin American countries who, who share a certain experience of colonization, language, religion, all those things, who are living the immigrant experience together in the US now. We are sharing something together. We have a common code. Is that, I hope that makes sense for somebody. It's just the way that I, I'm able to bring us all together. So um, in, in that interview, you talk about, there, there's this concept of being Latino as uh, um, having a reason to be in a position to become Americans. It's sort of wrapped up with what you said. It's, it's the, yeah. this national experience. Right. Um, but not wanting to let go of who we are, uh, right. where we're from. Yeah, and, just, yeah. sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. Uh, Nelly, you were the first Hispanic elected in um, a politician in all of New England. And, and we talked earlier before this, this, this program started about how you, you use Hispanic because if you said I'm the first Latino elected or the first Latina elected, people might go, oh, well, there was probably another Latino that was elected for her, right? Um, but you were the first, the first, right? So that was the only sort of gender neutral maybe way to really mm -hmm. encapsulate that, uh, which I found really interesting. But I also found interesting is um, I was reading um, your essay in the book. You talk about how local media did not refer to the mm -hmm. three Latino candidates that ran as Hispanic candidates, but rather mm -hmm. as candidates that happened to be Hispanic. And although that was not the only reason we won, making ethnicity a lesser mm -hmm. descriptor helped voters connect with us as candidates. And I'm struck by that symmetry, the idea that being mm -hmm. American was sort of, mm -hmm. had to come first. What are you, mm -hmm. was there tension in that balance? You know, it, for me, no, because I know who I am. And I think for a lot of us, uh, you know, we carry all these identities, right? Of, and we do all this code switching, depending on where we are. Now, I happen to be the type of Latina uh, who can easily be identified by someone physically as Italian or Portuguese. I mean, like we have a number, those are large ethnic groups here in Rhode Island. And so... Um, you know, I, I recognize that that was part of the fact that people could relate to me and, you know, I don't have an accent, even though I was born in Puerto Rico and, and moved here for college and on to the mainland. Um, but, but so I guess, I don't know, I, I, there was tension when I was in my twenties, now in my fifties, not so much. I am who I am. And depending on who I'm talking to, it, it matters more or less. Um, I, I'll tell you that in my community work, I really go to that Latino, you know, construct because it's inclusive. 
and I'm trying to be inclusive in my work. I mean, the problems that we face as a society that as elected officials we're trying to, to tackle um, are faced by a wide variety of people. And, and so, you know, my ethnicity, my language, my, multi, my biculturalism, my, my, my bilingualism is, is an additional tool for me as an elected official in that I can see things in different perspectives. Um, but that, but I see it as a tool. I mean, the, the problems are, are universal in many, many ways. And the more that I can make them universal, the easier it is to get broad-based support for, for them as, as, as a solution to the problems. It's interesting, you, you, you talk about that inclusion component and mm -hmm. I'm gonna go to you, Laura, because you're, you have your, your latest book is Latinos, Inventing Latinos, a new story of American racism. Inventing Latinos, I, I'm, I'm suspecting has relevance to that notion of inclusivity because you talk about the national, um, you know, uh, people come from Puerto Rico in the Northeast and Cubans in Miami and, and, and Mexican-Americans, Chicanos in, in the Southwest. But we all came together under sort of its common identity and sort of Latino was invented. I, can you speak more to that and, and, um, and uh, talk a little bit about that thesis? Absolutely, thank you. And I'm really um, pleased to come after Anja and after Nelly because it's, it's like the perfect uh, uh, segue. I know that's no, no accident with our great moderator, but, but this idea that, that Anja, that you articulated of Latino is something that matters in the United States because of something that I call double colonization. Latin America was colonized by Spain and actually imperial US, right? And so that's that's the same definition that I use. And and to Nelly's point, you know, it it we got to a point, right? And this is about 1970. And if you if you went if you looked at the 1970 US and you'd say, first of all, there was no count of Hispanics or any of us at the national level, separately or together, right? So you couldn't say we are this number, but you could say in the Southwest, there's Mexican Americans. They've been there since the 1840s and continuously with, with new immigration infused. There were in South Florida, there were Cuban Americans, especially, you know, this is, if I'm talking about 1970, think about how much South Florida had changed just in that decade before, right? And in New England, there were Puerto Ricans, right? And so, so it, as, as people started thinking, political leads, uh, social workers, community organizers started thinking, how can we get some traction as a national group and get paid attention to? There was strength in numbers. And that's really when this invention of a pan-Hispanic or pan-Latino terminology begins at that time and you know the rest is history because that they push for the recognition in 1980 by the census and you know I, I won't take too much time now but I hopefully I'll get a chance to talk about these these brand new census results and what they what they tell us oh um so Laura is going to unfortunately have to leave us at the top of the hour so I'm gonna let her um mm -hmm. kind of talk a little bit more up front um but Laura, so I'm going to stick with you. So we had this hard time defining who we are, and there, there's there's maybe shared purpose, but then you know the Cubans are doing their own thing, and uh, <clears throat> so you know maybe not. But um, is common purpose possible? And again, this I think speaks to your you know people got together for a common purpose. Is that common purpose possible given the disparate? Uh, interests of these various communities. Well, well, you know, let's not let's not pretend that any other racial group is any more united than we are, mm -hmm. right? African Americans, they have their debates about terminology, and you go to a group, and you're going to find by age and by political affiliation and 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 maybe educational mm -hmm. level that there are differences, and you're going to find different different kinds of politics as well, right? You know that as well as I do, that there was this tremendous backlash among Blacks, uh, sort of Blacks in the Black church to the Black Lives Matter movement, right? And so there's not any, I don't think there's mm -hmm. any, you know, kind of imaginary unity anywhere. What there is, is that we began to, to see that other people see us as similar. Mm -hmm. And so then that pushes us to have this kind of greater uh, unity. And, and I think that's part of what we're seeing in these new census results. So if you look at the 2020 census, it's the culmination of 
50 years of data that shows that Latinos are decreasingly willing to identify as white. So in this new census, 15 million fewer Latinos identified as white. Because remember, there's the Latino ethnicity question, and then there's the race question. 15 million people between 2010 and 2020 decided they weren't white, who are Latinos, right? And where did they go? Well, some of them went into the other race, some other race, which is always a popular one for Latinos, myself included, because I always said, hey, I don't live this world, this life as a white person. I don't want to claim that I'm American Indian, even though I know I am indigenous. I have African ancestry, but I'm not going to, I don't live as a black person. I'm not going to say that I'm black, right? Other, that's a really big segment and growing, but also those people who identified with, with two or more races is hugely um, larger. And it's not that people, it's not that we've changed, it's that the nation is changing. It's just, it's surviving Trump and surviving El Paso, right? And surviving the, the you know, continuing racism. That brings us, unfortunately, that brings us closer together. Um, and of course, as the data comes, becomes more, um, as we get more data, we'll be able to break that down. Okay, in Rhode Island, what are Latinos? How did they break down? It, Cuban Americans, how did they break down, right? And we've seen some trends in the past that, you know, I could try to, I could predict for you, but we, ha we don't have all of the breakdowns on that data yet. But that initial data is very interesting, showing us moving away from uh, what I call census white to the other race and to the multiracial um, category. And in fact, other is today the second largest race in the United States because of Latinos. Wow. Well, Laura's uh, comments are literally, like I'm hearing her and I'm going through my college years. I, I went to college in the 80s and went from being, you know, Puerto Rican, born and raised in Puerto Rico. So everybody's like you and you arrive on a, you know, a campus in New Jersey and you're like, what, what do you mean I'm a minority? Like what? Like, huh? No, no. like, and it was like learning for me, college was that sort of learning process of identity and do I identify as an international person or do I identify as a Latino or Hispanic in those days, it was really Hispanic uh, starting to edge into Latino. And, and it was kind of this realization that the rest of the world is gonna see us as Hispanic you might as well use it because, you know, it's like getting into all the divisions was only going to make it harder for us to negotiate with the university to improve the conditions that we were all facing that were really fairly similar, no matter whether you came from, you know, you were Chicano from East L.A. Uh, or, or you were, you know, from the mainland or, or Puerto Rican or, or from the island. Um, and then I moved to Rhode Island. And similarly, we kind of all came to that conclusion and, and, and established this Latino political action committee uh, that we affectionately called Real PAC. And that was incredibly diverse in terms of ethnic groups of, of different uh, countries of origin. And, and I'm proud to say that, that, you know, that led to a number of us going into appointed and elected positions. And today, Rhode Island has 35 Latino, uh, Latina electeds. More than half of them are, are Latinas and they represent nine different countries of origin. And that doesn't just happen, that has to be created in that you create a space of Hispanic identity that respects the differences, but comes together. And also, um, I think that it ties back to the title of the book that we're discussing, <laughs> right? If we wanna win, we need to understand the context of who we are talking to. So I um, understand what Nelly was explaining, right? In the campaign, this is what worked best. In my daily life, I want to be inclusive. And the reality is that when people see a, a Latino, Hispanic, whatever we want to call it, they know what they're seeing. And, you know, whatever the name, they understand the difference um, and what brings us together. So, I mean, whatever works is my, yeah. my take. Yeah. Um, now, you actually had to campaign and work with these various groups. When you're thinking about public policy, when you're thinking mm -hmm. about government, is there a difference in how you talk to the Puerto Rican community as opposed to the Mexican community, the Salvadoran communities in your state? Um, broadly, no, actually, not, not here because um, 
You know, I mean, the only issues that, that where that matters is whether you're talking about immigration issues, comprehensive immigration reform, which for everybody else other than Puerto Ricans, it's an issue, um, or or the the status of Puerto Rico and 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 the bills that are being debated in Congress. That's the only time actually that really you sort of die. I personally dive into the 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 country of origin differences. Other than that, you know, we're kind of going through Rhode Island with similar experiences, honestly, based on more on race, gender, and class, socioeconomic class, and, and educational attainment than, than I think, you know, the country of origin per se. So let me pull Laura back then, because she talked about how we, we all came together mm -hmm. as a community because it was easier to advocate for those shared issues. Um, does that in any way sort of suggest that at some point maybe we the those nationalities start erasing um, and we become more homogenized as an American or you know Latino American, supposed to broadly Latin American? Um, does that happen in this in this in this process? I, I don't know that I see that happening. People are very attached. If you ask people the question, mm -hmm. what do you prefer to call yourself? They will choose, Latinos will choose a national origin. Uh, name, right? Uh, Chicana or Mexican American for myself before they'll choose Latinx, Latina, Latino or Hispanic, right? That's, that's, but it's very situational, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it depends. Am I sitting in my living room and I'm talking to somebody that I know well, mm -hmm. or am I being interviewed uh, as I leave a polling place, right? Mm -hmm. There are all these different contexts that where Again, it, part of it is we're always watching with one eye on how are they seeing us? And we know who the they is and they know who the we are. I agree with that, you know? Um, you know, there's some very interesting research. So, so if you think about the 62 million Latinos in the United States as of probably an undercount as of the 2020 <laughs> census, 65% of them are Mexican American, 65%. So depending on where you are, if no matter what you are, you guys are gonna be taken for Mexican American, mm -hmm. right? Now, um, obviously if you're in Florida, that's gonna be a different dynamic, but even in Florida, look at what the data says and Anja, you are living there so you can speak to this more authoritatively, but Cuban Americans are no longer the, the majority of the Latino population in the state of Florida. That's right. right? For for years now, for a couple of years now, mm -hmm. and, when the, and with the influx of post Maria Puerto Ricans, mm -hmm. Florida is now threatening to become the number one uh, state for Puerto Ricans, and second would be New York, which I don't know how long that would have taken to, to, to happen, mm -hmm. right, if, if Maria hadn't happened. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. But, you know, I also want to add something, like, think back to 9-11. I know a lot of Latinos who were surprised after 9-11 to, to discover how much they loved this country and how much they loved their life here and how much of that had seeped into their hearts. Um, and then comes the question, right, of, of guilt or, and I resolved it a long time ago by knowing I am 100% Puerto Rican and I'm 100% American. I respect mm -hmm. the place where I am and I try to contribute as much as I can to the place where I live. Mm -hmm. I respect it. I respect its laws and I try to give back to it. Um, and the other 100% of me is, um, is my culture, my roots. And for me, those roots are a gift to this country. I, I'm giving it. I'm contributing. Them. I, I totally agree with you, uh, Laura. And, and what, what I find interesting is, you know, um, as our communities continue to inhabit spaces right together, um, you know, I wondered my, my own children, for example, whether they would identify as Puerto Rican and, you know, and the truth of the matter is, is that it depends on sort of the influx of kids and, and people around, around you. Um, so I think that, that the fact that we have had such a, a, a rapid growth of the Latino population throughout the U.S. And I'm talking, I mean, people are always surprised that it's Rhode Island, right? Wait, there's Puerto Ricans, there's, there's Latinos in in Rhode Island, yeah, there are 18% as of the last census. And we worked really hard because we actually, Latinos in Rhode Island helped save the second congressional district in Rhode Island now for three censuses in a row. Uh, otherwise we would have gotten down to just one. So, uh, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's a, it, and, and people get stuck on the terminology, but I don't think it's worth it, you know? 
you are who you are and, and you feel different in different moments and that's fine. We're, we're complex individuals and to be stereotyped by language, by, by linguistic terms is an unfortunate uh, situation. One thing I do want to, and I, you know, I apologize because I have to, I have to say goodbye early, but I do want to, Marcos, if I may, just jump back in to say, I, I don't want to gloss over the differences that there are as well. And I know that my colleagues on the panel will agree with me, right? And in particular, I think it's, it's wonderful that we are now talking about Afro-Latinos and the way, mm -hmm. in the way that we are, which wasn't the case. Um, I too went to college in the 80s, right? And that wasn't the case. We didn't have that awareness. We didn't have almost that, that language. And now it's really a priority. And I think similarly with in, in, in California, I'm in Los Angeles, indigenous Latinos for whom Spanish is their second language, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're facing some of the deepest oppression here. And we haven't, we haven't found all the ways that we need to bring those folks in and to really make sure that we're, um, that we're serving everyone. Um, but uh, I think that this book goes a long way toward just putting the spotlight where it needs to be and encouraging us to have those conversations. So uh, we're about to lose Laura. So I wanna ask this question, I'll start with her and then you you know you have to say goodbye. Um, during the 2020 campaign cycle, when the media talked about Joe Biden, they didn't say Joe Biden, the white guy, um, or any sort of descriptors. Maybe Catholicism came up in the context of that he was a pro-choice Catholic and the bishops wanted to take away his communion, but it, it wasn't sort of, he wasn't defined by his race and his maleness. Uh, com contrast that to Kamala Harris, right? Which was, you always mentioned she was a woman, always mentioned she was uh, black, always mentioned that she was South Asian Indian. And so, I, you know, when you talk about colonization and double colonization and, and sort of the shared identity, do you see in America where Latinos similarly become the, the fact that they're Latino is sort of an asterisk, kind of kind of like maybe it was um, in the Rhode Island Secretary of State race, you know, with Nelly and, and the other uh, Latinos running in Rhode Island, where it wasn't the primary focus or a focus, just sort of background information if you were to Google it's a very interesting question. So I'll, I'll take just a couple of minutes to give you my perspective. And, and I'm going to uh, do it by talking about two twins, one of whom ran for president, one of whom is in, in Congress and speaking out um, these days. And, and you know, I, I think that it, there are a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, what is it, Monday morning quarterbacking we can do about the Castro campaign. Um, but I think that one of the reasons that that didn't get the kind of traction that it might have is that being Latino and being Mexican American and brown skinned didn't, it wasn't intelligible in the way that some other stories were. Now, combine that, and I want to just kind of shine a light on some of his brother's words recently because he's talking about the fact that the media establishment and the mm -hmm. uh, publishing establishment doesn't know who we are. We're not on the agenda. And I think mm -hmm. that that's still true. So I think maybe Marcos, maybe there is that very long-term, I don't know if it's gonna happen in my lifetime, but, but, but because there's, there's really, I think there's a long way to go on that. And I apologize that I have to sign off, but thank you. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. Uh, now I'm gonna I'm gonna take it to you. It was clear that there was a reason that people talked up your the fact that you were Latina. I mean, you you were, you, you shattered a glass ceiling. A real it was a real mm -hmm. accomplishment. So of course you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna mention that. Do you see a world where that becomes less and less of a factor? Say you you oh, know you have a long absolutely yeah, absolutely and 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 it's, it's very much to how our our. Uh, Vice President, you know, came up with that that term. You know, I, I may be the first, but I won't be the last. Uh, in my time in office, in the seven years, it was my second term as Secretary of State. Uh, I, you know, we've gone from twelve Latino electeds, and I'm talking from school committee all the way to my position, uh, to thirty five. From twelve to thirty five uh, in a span of seven years, and I see the next election where actually I'm going to be on the ballot in twenty two as a candidate for governor. There's going to be 
a, an Afro-Latina who's currently been the appointed Lieutenant Governor. She's gonna run for election. Uh, we have a candidate uh, who's Colombiano um, uh, with strong ties to the Dominican community as well, who's running for mayor of Providence, Gonzalo Cuervo. So, and, and, and we have a Puerto Rican mayor of Central Falls. And so you're starting to really see a transformation in the political sector in Rhode Island to embrace the fact that we're here and, and we're willing to do the work and, and we wanna represent not just Latinos. I mean, I cringed the other day because somebody, there was an art, oh, there was an op-ed, uh, an editorial that described me, uh, that the first descriptor was that I, Nelly Gorbea, uh, Secretary of State, champion of Hispanic causes. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, really? that's where you go? I mean, no, like I'm actually, uh, a secretary of state that has transformed the way elections run in Rhode Island to make it uh, more secure and more accessible to vote. And we had a record turnout during the pandemic where everybody was happy about how they voted in terms of the mechanics of voting. Like, you know, I've made it more, I've made it simpler for businesses to start and thrive throughout the state. I, I go and buy uh, something at a store and, and the store owners frequently thank me and, and say they love my website. And I never thought I'd hear business people say they love government. And these are not people in the Latino community. I mean, these are people throughout the state. So, so I really struggle with this concept of, you know, like getting sort of pigeonholed, like basically getting pigeonholed, because I do think that it separates you in a way that doesn't help when you are trying to be, you know, part of the leadership class of, of, of the country, of, of, of your state. You want to make sure that people understand, yeah, sure. I'm Latina, I'm Puerto Rican, just as there's an Italian American Democrat next to me and there's a Portuguese here and there's a Cape Verdean over there. But, but I'm working for everybody, regardless of race, ethnicity or, or, or gender affiliation. Yeah, that's almost, that's laziness, right? It, mm -hmm. it's, it's just, let's, let's drop somebody. I mean, it's the old um, woman showed up at the New York Times and they'd want her to go to the lifestyle section. Oh, she can work. She can write for the lifestyle section, right? I mean, it, there's a laziness in those preconceived notions. Uh, and I'm really curious. You, you, you're a novelist, mm -hmm. and you write about. You know, your stories have Latino characters. It, mm -hmm. Is there a point where you had to sort of stop yourself from falling into sort of nationalistic cliches about different segments of the Latino community uh, and not having each individual be a full-fledged, <laughs> you know, deep, complex. Is, is that something that, that's an issue? It's, um, uh, I think it's evolved naturally. I think it's different from Nelly's situation where I, could, I can see how in government, um, the message needs to be you work for everybody, regardless of whether you're white, black, or whatever, right? In media and in arts, I think it's different because the culture is an asset. So um, for me, it was about giving voice. I'm gonna give you an example. Recently, I wrote an op-ed. Um, the title of the op-ed was, I used to call myself Afro-Latina. Here's why I was wrong. And my argument was that in, in Puerto Rico, if you have a little black, you're black. You're only white, if, that's how I grew up. So all my life, I'm black, that's how I, but coming into this country and realizing what black people go through and realizing that I'm not racialized as a black person, as an African-American person, whereas my black Latinos are, then I decided to stop calling myself Afro-Latina because when I call myself Afro-Latina, I erase them. I make it okay for people to choose me and say, oh, look, mm -hmm. I have a black person when when really they're not right but that's a racial context and so by my not calling myself afro latina if anything afro descendiente which we all are mm -hmm. right um i hope to shine light and to give space to those latinos who are racialized as black and go through a completely different experience than i than, than i um not to say that i'm never discriminated but not like they are so you know, it just depends on the context. Um, so in my, in my writing, to answer your question, I began really wanting to give voice to those Latino characters and now just writing everything. So my, my, my fiction and my nonfiction that's recent goes everywhere. So the title of the book is If We Want to Win. And all three of us have chapters um, that discuss certain aspects of, of of winning, right? I talk about the role of anti-Latino uh, bigotry in our nation's politics, and Donald Trump obviously exemplifies that. 
Uh, I know that um, that um, Nelly talked about better, more representation in, in having more elected officials. And Anja, you focused on domestic violence and mm -hmm. uh, and that cultural acceptance mm -hmm. of, of that violence. There's, I would argue that those are sort of steps towards something. If you talk about if we want to win, that there's a broader goal, there's a broader vision, right? I mean, what if we were to stamp out domestic violence, then if we were to stamp out racism in our in our domestic politics, then if we elect more elected officials, then I'm curious about what that end vision looks like for both of you. So, uh, mm -hmm. Nelly, do you want to talk about what that looks like? What yeah. does winning look like? Oh. It actually means, in my case, in Rhode Island, uh, a state that actually does much better. It actually prospers economically because it's utilizing its human resources to the max. Um, you know, I like to tell people that our best public policy decisions come when there's a diversity of opinions, perspectives, and backgrounds in the in the, around the policy making table. And it, yeah, it takes longer because not everybody thinks the same, sees things the same way. But but your solution from a public policy, public sector perspective is a much stronger one and, and, and one that has deeper roots. Um, and so to me, what it means to win is, is getting to that better place where we do see opportunities. I mean, I look at you know, people in emerging markets and in the black and brown communities that really don't have access to uh, some of the government programs simply because of the barriers that we've put. One of the first things I did when I came in was to put all the business forms in plain English. And I basically said, stop with the legalese. Nobody cares. And, and, and you know what? When you put it in plain English, you can actually translate it really, really easily into plain Spanish. And even Google Translate, it can, can, uh, Google Translate can even get it right. And, and that means that you make government accessible instead of a barrier and a series of hoops. And that person is going to go on and start their business and, and thrive. Uh, so, or at least not have government be the barrier to making them thrive, you know, if, whether they, they, they succeed or not depends on their business uh, acumen and, and, and their experience. But that to me is the, the win. It's, it's a societal win uh, that's, that really utilizes all of our talents. Angela? Um, so I, I was happy to, to participate in the book because I see the book, if we want to win as a collection of views and solutions, right? So for me, what the book says is before we can solve the problem, before we can win, we need to identify the real problems. In the case of my essay, what I'm espousing is that, yes, we can have more laws against domestic violence and gender violence. We can have all kinds of things, but if we don't, if we, if we allow our governments to keep putting out the, these messages, this, these patriarchal messages, we continue making the problem possible not just in our community where, where there's, there's evidence that there's more of, but in everything else. So for me, that's how we win by identifying, by going beyond what we have thought the problem is and, and, and finding those places that will have the most impact. A little yeah, bit like me, Nelly's uh, translation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody's impressed with legalese. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nobody is. Uh, for me, it's, it's when you look at disparate, um, effects on on society and different people, right? Nobody mm -hmm. think nobody says Italian Americans have lower survival, you know, um, survival rates or economic disparity than German Americans and Irish Americans, right? I mean, there's sort of a uniformity. Yeah, although in, at one time there were. Yeah. So, but they've been able to even out, and so that to me is the win, right? That when we can get to that. Right, so I would love a, a I would love a world where yeah we we could look across the board and you know not just obviously our community but also you know with the black community mm -hmm. everybody and you're not seeing and men and women and mm -hmm. and uh, you're not seeing those disparities because of somebody's um, innate characteristic that that would be what that victory looks like. It's obviously easier to to do that if you look the same to an, to an outsider, right? So it's a lot harder to discriminate against a German American if you don't know if she's Irish or German. Um, I'm just curious, I mean, we, you know, with the black uh, community Asians and us, 
it's easy to other us. And that was mm -hmm. a big part of, of my essay was just how wedded an entire segment of the country is to othering us specifically. Not mm -hmm. not Asians. They have their own the the model minority myth, which is its own you know special kind of racism. Uh, the black community obviously systemic and and given the roots of it are you know they very much rooted in racism. But right now we're we're seeing this sort of the invaders that are coming in and you know we're taking jobs and we're we're engaging in human trafficking and and it's a very ugly othering. Huh? do we ever get beyond that? Or do we just wait for those people to sort of die off, which is what the census just told us. And I wish Laura was here to talk about that. But the census showed a dramatic decline in white only uh, Americans to the tune of about 1% a year. Yeah, no, so I, I think so, I hope so. I'm a, you know, I'm a perpetual optimist, otherwise I couldn't be an elected official. Um, you know, it's interesting when I first arrived in uh, Rhode Island 30 years ago and you're out, you know, trying to get to know this new place that you're living in. I went to a place called the Museum of Work and Culture and they have um, a whole exhibit on French Canadians who came to the city of Woonsocket or Woonsocket as we like to call it and, 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 and were there. And in the 50s, if you walk the streets of Woonsocket, you would hear French being spoken constantly. Just like you can hear Spanish in South Providence today, and 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 there were this this whole exhibit on newspaper articles depicting those lazy, good for nothing French Canadians who all they want to do is live in their little hovels of Woodsocket and have babies and not work and blah blah, blah and not speak English. And I'm reading these articles and going like, oh my gosh! Like you could like do a Mad Lib and like replace you know the ethnicity you know with you know Hispanics today or whatever. And, and, and today, you know, French Canadians have been able to be a part of the sort of fabric, although there still are cultural heritage type activities in Woonsocket. You don't hear French anymore on the street. It's actually largely now, the largest minority there right now is Puerto Rican. Um, so, I, you know, I have to believe that, that, you know, even with us, I mean, the challenge is, is one of race to me, more than even ethnicity, because this country has really had a very hard time coming to terms with issues of, of racial discrimination. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, in that sort of broader vision though, when, when you look at um, sort of the evening of outcomes in the white community, there's also a sort of loss in that national identity, right? I mean, somebody may be Italian American, but it's, I mean, I guess there's some, some areas of the country, I get New England's a big one where people still wave their Irish and their oh. Italian flags. You don't see that in a lot of the rest of the country. And would we even want an America? Is there a trade off there to, to yeah. you're so integrated that you lose me? I mean, here I am wearing a shirt that I bought in the mountains of El Salvador in a indigo producing region. They've been doing this indigo since Mayan times with a Mayan logo. I love being Salvadoran and I don't know if I would make a trade if for if we can to have pure sort of equality of outcome, but lose who I am from a national standpoint. Um, is that a trade you would make? No, and but I, and I, I think that's yeah. a false sort of thing that you have to. I mean, I, yeah, I mean that's part of what I'm. It, it's it's um, no, I, I absolutely refuse to do that. Now, what I want people to recognize is that yes, I'm Puerto Rican, but I'm also a woman, I'm also a mom, um, and I happen to be an elected official and that's my job right now. And, and, and so you, ethnicity to me is part of you know, who you are, but it's not the only thing. And so you know, I, my first year in office, um, we, have, we have this thing called reading week where you go and read books to kids in schools. And the mom and me, when I first heard about it, I was like, really, seriously? We're gonna interrupt the school day for like politicians to go in and do this and do a photo op. I, but I did it because everybody else was doing it. And I came in and I showed up and, and it turns out I was actually in, in Woonsocket and uh, I walk into this like, I don't know, fourth grade class and I identify myself and I went from Puerto Rico originally. And you could see these kids like puff up. now. I don't think of myself as the Puerto Rican Secretary of State. I think of myself as Nelly Gorbea, Secretary of State of Rhode Island, and who happens to be Puerto Rican. But to them, to see somebody who came from those same roots 
be in those positions made it really a, a, a transformative experience in a way that I really didn't appreciate because I grew up in Puerto Rico and everybody was Puerto Rican around me. So, so there's a value to keeping to on, you know, latching on still to your identity from the perspective of, of helping others see themselves as, uh, as, as these other positions in our society. And so I hope that we don't lose it anytime soon. And, and I don't think we will. Anjay, Boricuas are never giving up their identity, are they? Oh, no, never. <laughs> it's been never. 500 but... years of college. <laughs> no. so. In fact, I think it's gotten stronger precisely because we don't have a national identity. You know, people grow up in Puerto Rico asking us, am I American? Am I Puerto Rican? Wait a minute, I, I'm a territory. Most people don't know that I'm a citizen. Um, and that makes us uh, cling even more to the cultural. There's a cultural nation without borders, I feel. Um, where you have more Puerto Ricans outside of Puerto Rico than you have inside. But personally, I found that, like Nelly was saying, it's a false choice in that I don't have to be one or the other. I can be both. I can love here, the here and the now, and be a mom and be have dogs, be a dog owner, and love reggae and all those other things, and also have my roots to contribute. I think when we see it as a contribution, um, it, yeah. We don't have to choose, I think. That's true. And besides, I, I want to continue to go to Salvadoran bakeries to get you know, like pupusas. So. Oh my God, yes. I want, a, I want a whole bed spread with that color. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. So we have a question from an audience member, uh, which I almost knew it was going to come up, which is why I led with this. And it's a question again. I think people are still confused about the difference between Latino, Latinx, Hispanic. So the question is, can each of you answer the following question? Do the descriptions Latino, Latinx, Hispanic mean the same thing to you or do you see distinctions? I'll, I'll actually start. Um, each one of those words actually has a real emotional reaction in me. And I can see it even within um, Hispanic, I think is, is an older term. It's a much broader term. Uh, the activist in me almost sees, sees it as an accommodationist term. It's like, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's an invention of the US census, right? As opposed to, uh, too bad Laura's not here to talk about that. But um, it's the same as Mexican American versus Chicano Chicana, right? Mm -hmm. One of them has a more aggressive edge and one of them is a more accommodationist, more like, you know, we're, we're good, we're Mexican American. Let's, let's not ruffle feathers. It could be wrong. I'm not saying this is how everybody interprets it. That's just the way it, feels to me. Latinx is a bunch of college kids like throwing in an X that doesn't make any sense and I hate it. And uh, I actually, it's funny, during during uh, the aftermath of the election, um, Trump made gains in the southern border in Texas. And so somebody asked what, you know, people needed to do so that we weren't losing more ground politically uh, to the Republicans, the Latino community not losing more ground to the Republicans. And Ruben Gallego, who is a congressman in mm -hmm. Arizona and a progressive champion, literally tweeted, the response was, first, start by not using the term Latinx. I mean, it, it, <laughs> it sounds just yeah, like him. Yeah, no, it's not really like him. And like I said, his Pew study found that 65% of Latinos do not want to see wider adoption of the term Latinx. But it comes from a good place. And it comes from the, uh, it's taken away the genderization, right? So Latino mm -hmm. can be Latino, O is masculine, Latina is feminine, but it's a Latino community and, and the, uh, you know, the Latino agenda. And, and so it's sort of, there's a gender component. So in the book tries to use Latin A with an E mm -hmm. and uh, which in Spanish is sort of, I guess, between O and A. And so there's some logic to it, but again, you're trying to reinvent language to, and it's always very, very difficult. And I was saying earlier, I would be happy with just going with Latin getting rid of all the A's and E's. This is the sort of the big debate. So, but actually that's how it feels to me. So I'd like uh, you guys to also answer the question. Um, so, so here's how I would answer the question from the, the person who's watching us. All these things have a meaning, okay? I'm Hispanic. I was Hispanic when I was born in Puerto Rico. I, don't, I didn't have to come to the United States to be Hispanic. I speak Spanish. I come from a Spanish language speaking country. I'm Hispanic like Nelly, like Marcos. Um, Latinx, like Marcos was saying, it has a specific meaning. You know, it's about being inclusive to LGBTQ 
and on gendering um, our language, mm -hmm. which in Spanish, by the way, it's very gender, la mesa, you know, la escuela. You know, we, we, we think of even inanimate things in gendered terms. And I think that that can use a little bit of, of uh, loosening. Um, Latin is, a, is, is the original context, right? Um, from, from the Latin. And Latin American is people from those countries. All those things have meanings and, and they're very clear meanings. Um, it's just about how the person asking wants to put themselves out. Like Nelly was saying, what works best for you? What, what helps you to communicate better? What helps you be of service better? What makes people around you more comfortable? If you want to communicate with them and you mm -hmm. need to work with them to win or to help others, right? So all these things have meanings for me. I use, I use Latinx because I want to be inclusive, but I use also Latino or Latina because to me, that's, I'm only Latina here. And so it has a very specific meaning. I'm Puerto Rican everywhere else, Hispanic from the moment I was born. I'm only Latina because I live here. And when in Vegas didn't live, live here, I wouldn't be. I would just be Puerto Rican. And, and it's funny because I guess in English, when, now that we're thinking about linguistics, which I think actually is a fascinating subject, you know, you think about, okay, so you're Irish American, you're Italian American, but you don't have all the, like in, in Puerto, for Puerto Ricans, you're gonna be Puerto Rican, Boricua, um, you know, Latino, Hispanic, I agree, yeah. uh, that's right. I mean, so, and, and, and you were saying, and Marcos also about, you know, that's, I, I had forgotten about, you know, like there's Chapines, Chapines and you know, like all these other terms that we've invented. So we're very much used to not having just one, denomination one one word that encapsulates everything and i think it's part of the richness of being latinos or latinx or hispanic i don't get offended i do agree that there's a political connotation to the you know the going from more conservative staid hispanic which i do use sometimes um in my biography i'm the first hispanic elected and i you know i did that purposefully because i didn't want to get into like i was the latina but then was a guy elected before whatever so, and Latinx was like way too strange still. <laughs> so, so then, but then now there's Latinx and then there's Latine in the book. And I'm like, you know what, whatever. I know who I am. I, it doesn't matter. As long as you're not insulting me, we're, we're all good. That actually speaks of the, how difficult it is for us even collectively, because we all ascribe our own values and experiences and even just people around us. I mean, Hispanic is very prevalent in the Northeast. It's just right. uh, it, in it, not... It they're not thinking the politics of it. They just, who are we? And and and, it, and if you go to East, uh, New Mexico, it's Hispano. Yeah, they're Hispanos. They're not Hispanics. So yeah. I really feel sorry for anybody outside of our community looking and trying <laughs> to figure out what do we call these people because I almost I think that the, the question was like, okay, so what do we call you? And we're like, eh. yeah. <laughs> yeah, just uh, so, you know, oh, you can always just ask, hey, how do you prefer to to be referred to? I mean, that's always the polite thing to do but well, people don't um, get but, offended i i just no, like they uh, don't. Nelly. no i think it's you more know. of actually honestly it's more of people who are not hispanic being like scared of of, 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 of sort of being misunderstood or i don't know right. so i agree yeah, and, and norms are so evolving especially right now mm -hmm. it seems that you know that everything's lightning speed so uh you know, you see that with the Black community, which, you know, has gone through several evolutions, including most recently African-American. And now there's a move towards going back to Black because there was a realization mm -hmm. that that was not inclusive of uh, Blacks from the Caribbean or Blacks from Latin America, that there is a whole world of Black people that don't come from Africa. Uh, most That's not their experience. They, were, they didn't come to the United States through Africa. And so, and, and obviously with the Asian community, you have South Asian Indians and Chinese, and my God, that's even, the, the difference there seem even more obviously stark, yet they all come from this massive continent. And so um, it, it becomes challenging and, and uh, we are almost out of time. So Nelly, do you see that from a, from a governmental standpoint, mm -hmm. the way the census is handling the issue now, um, do you feel like they're getting closer to being able to get a handle on this very difficult question of, of identity? Um, that's a tough one. I'm just glad that the question was kept in the census to start with. I mean, I am, I really am. I mean, it's, um, 
it, it's really important that we be allowed to count ourselves. I think that the way that they're allowing for multiple, it's not just you choose one, uh, even in terms of identities is really important um, because a lot of our kids are, you know, from different backgrounds. They're, it's not all one community. We live in a very mobile society. So, you know, yes, I think that that overall the census has been moving in a better, better uh, direction uh, because it, in the end it's counting people the way they want to be counted, not, you know, because of somebody's specific predisposition or or, or mandates, um, there should be, I mean, government should work for people uh, and, and should reflect and be representative of what people want in that particular time. Angela, you're sort of in almost a, like one of the biggest melting pots of our community in the country down in South Florida. And, and so I, I look at my kids and they are Salvadoran, a quarter Salvadoran, quarter Greek, quarter Puerto Rican, quarter Cuban. And I don't even know what they're gonna make of themselves when they start having that, you know, who they are, what that identity is. You obviously, you write about this community, you are part of that community. How are you seeing people handle that, 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 you know, it's not so simple anymore. It's not just, I'm Puerto Rican. How do you see well, that people handling that? We all like to talk smack about each other, <laughs> but then totally. whenever anybody attacks a person who's also Latino, we all come out and protest. Um, I think there were some differences politically that came out in this last election and the, the one before it with the Cuban American um, with the Cuban American community. And I just think that um, liberal um, elected officials and Democrats need to learn how to speak to that community. Mm -hmm. um, very quick example, you know, when the protests recently, President Biden, who I voted for, came out four days later. And you know he he did a very nice thing. He put a statement out, but it's about validating a certain pain and a certain experience. So he would have won a lot of votes if on that Sunday he would have come out and spoken directly to and you know said a word because people here saw it as protecting the protesters who were going to be killed in the streets. And if he had said something that day, so now you have another new hurt. Mm. And and I hate living. I'm a liberal living surrounded by Trump signs and Pence signs and, you know, all these. Um, and for me, it was like, oh, my God, opportunity to speak to people directly and to really say you understand them. That's what it's like living here. But other than that, we just, you know, we, we want to continue to talk smack about each other. You know, Chileans want to say that their Pisco is better than the Peruvian one. Um, God forbid somebody would tell me that mango is better than mofongo because we will have a problem. You know, normal yeah. life. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's, I think it's time to wrap up. So Nelly, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave um, the audience with? No, just that, um, thank you first of all uh, to the Center for Brooklyn History for allowing us to have this fun conversation. Uh, I always learn something and I always think uh, about some, leave thinking something differently when I have these conversations with, with my own uh, community members. Uh, and, and, and just that, you know, embrace it. We're, we're, we're here, it's, it's, try not to be scared of engaging people in what should be civil conversations about differences. We have to come to a place where we can do that and ask, and, and, and if you hurt someone, ask for forgiveness and move on. Um, those are really important things that we need to cal uh, cultivate in our own communities, uh, regardless of where we're from. I'm right, just same for you. Um, I, everything that she said, but I would also add, and as a, as a former journalist, read and not just, don't just believe the first thing you read. Even if I tell you, go and find two other sources, credible sources. Let's be educated about where we get our information from and learn to identify credible information. And then once we're informed, let's listen. And I think if we do those two things, a lot of good will happen and a lot of this whole polarization and, and all this stuff will, will go away on its own or will minimize on its own, so. Yeah, uh, and, and for me, it's sort of building on that, the idea of don't be afraid to be inquisitive. Um, Language is in flux, identity is in flux, uh, national identity, racial identity, sexual identity, all of these things are being examined. 
and there's a whole new generation of kids coming in and they're shaking things up their own way, right? They're, they're, they're throwing out the playbook. They don't care what, what tradition looks like. They're going to do it their own way. And so it's, it's, it's legitimately confusing and it's okay to be confused. It's okay to, to sometimes roll with it. Um, just like, I also think it's okay for me to be like, yeah, that Gen X stuff or not Gen X, um, uh, Latinx stuff really not working for me, but it's part of the debate the discussion. There's nothing monolithic about it. And we really want to be monolithic about it. There's a lot of us, we all have our own ideas and it's okay to roll with it. It actually, I think, adds spice and excitement mm -hmm. and, and makes us all a much more interesting world than if, than when I look at these 50, um, sort of posters, everybody with their, you know, with their suitcase going to work and they all wearing the same suit. And mm -hmm. I guess that, that, that to me is horrifying. Like, I love yeah. the world that we live in. It's different. It's strange. It's odd. It's confusing. Sometimes it's infuriating, but it's lovely. And so again, thank you for joining mm -hmm. this panel. I'm glad, I'm glad the publisher got us all together. This was absolutely fantastic. Marcia, thank you so much for hosting us. You guys thank have been you. wonderful. Right. What a fantastic conversation. What a, what, a, what a treat to listen to you all talking. Thank you all so much for this. Um, identity, equality, confusion. I mean, you hit all the points. It's one, it was wonderful. I want to um, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I want to tell everybody that this has been recorded um, and you can watch it on the Center for Brooklyn History YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, the book again is If We Want to Win. I hope that you will um, see in the in the in the chat again the link to our local bookstore where you can get it. Um, and speaking of identity and also struggle for justice, I really have to mention two programs that we have next week um, that are fantastic. Next Tuesday, as part of our public history initiative called Brooklyn Resist, which is all about Black-led protests for racial justice, we'll be looking at expression of protest through visual arts. Um, uh, we have Dred Scott and uh, photographer Ruddy Roy in conversation. It's gonna be an incredible, incredible program. And then the next day on Wednesday, um, uh, we, we're gonna welcome Howard French, who is going to talk about a history of Africa that has largely been hidden and misinterpreted, a history that he tells in his new book, Born in Blackness. So I hope that you will join us for one or both of those programs and again, Thanks to all of you um, for this fantastic conversation. Um, everyone have, have a great night. Good night. Thank you. Bye.